Art Happenings. I'm Helen Moriarty. Tracy Spadafora demonstrates encaustic painting. She is a professional artist with 25 years of experience in encaustic. The artist has worked as a paint maker, then as a workshop instructor for the past 22 years. She also holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from Boston University and a Master's of Fine Arts degree at State University of New York. The artist maintains a studio in Westboro, Massachusetts, where she creates her encaustic paintings and holds workshops. Come with me to watch Tracy Spadafoda demonstrate painting with encaustic and to see what is happening. A long time ago, I went to Boston University for their um, BFA program. And while I was there, um, I studied with um, an encaustic painter, David Aronson, um, who was part of the Boston Expressionist Movement in um, Boston. Um, so I learned a little bit about encaustic painting when I was a student there. And then um, didn't really do anything with it. Um, maybe I did one painting while I was in school, and then I eventually um, ended up in um, New Paltz, New York at uh, State University of New York as a graduate student. And uh, I started working for this company, r &F Handmade Paints, um, and I was making um, encaustic paint by hand for this company while I was a student getting lots of free paint, which was the best part about it. Um, but what, it, what I didn't bargain for when I got this job was um, just having it be part of my life for a long, long time. So I just fell in love with the medium. I was Prior to that, I worked a lot with oils and acrylic. Um, I started using encaustic a little bit, um, and mostly as a mixed media technique when I started. And I just thought it was the the best thing ever, and um, I haven't stopped since. And so when I graduated from graduate school, there really wasn't anybody teaching at the time. Um, because I was working for r &F, they were starting up their first workshops in the late 90s, and I helped them set up their workshops in Kingston, New York. And then um, I decided I wanted, wanted to move back to the Boston area, which where I had been prior to going to graduate school, and I was going to try to teach encaustic workshops there. So at first, nobody knew what it was, nobody wanted to hire me. And then I got a couple of gigs, and then once teachers started taking my workshop, they started telling their friends, and all of a sudden I was teaching probably 20 different places during the year. Um, but it was a lot of traveling, a lot of moving around, schlepping all my equipment, and so I did that for over 10 years, and I don't do that anymore. I mostly just teach in my own studio, and occasionally I do these demos, or I, you know, a few times a year I might teach at another location, um, you know. But where's, I just, where's your studio located? My studio is in Westboro, Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah, I have a home studio. So I've, I've also moved my studio about five times in the past <laughs> six years. Um, so anyway, it's been great. I love the medium. I, I still love it after all these years. And I love to teach it because I just work with artists of all different levels, um, come from different backgrounds, um, different styles. And it's nice to be able to offer them something, you know, that some knowledge that I have that helps them, you know, push them to in a different direction or to a new level in their work by just using a different medium. Um, so uh, a little bit about um, encaustic. Encaustic um, comes from the word encaustic comes from the Greek word encausticos, and that means to burn in. So the actual technique. Um, in order for it to be called encaustic, it has to be uh, fused, it has to be melted. Um, so we call the paint that we're going to be using encaustic paint, and we call the technique encaustic, um, and it's because we melt the paint. Um, so the encaustic paint is made of three different ingredients. Um, pigment, which is the same pigment that they use in other types of paints. Um, 
So you have your, you know, your cadmiums, your cobalts, pretty much just about any pigment that they use in acrylic or oil, they use with encaustic. Um, and then the main um, body of the wax is wax. I mean, the, the main body of the paint is wax. So thus you have to have a hot palette to heat it up. So this is a chunk of encaustic paint. Um, you can buy encaustic paint from a number of, of um, uh, vendors, okay, online or at some stores. Um, I still use mostly RNF paint because I worked for them for years and they give me a good discount. Um, and yeah, you just melt it on the palette like this. So the binder is beeswax. Um, it's important that it's, it's, that it's beeswax because beeswax is very chemically complex. Um, almost all of the techniques I'm going to show you today are because of the beeswax. So you can't replace the beeswax and encaustic paint with a cheaper wax like paraffin or microcrystallized wax. Um, and the third ingredient in the paint is something called Demar resin, um, which unfortunately I have a little bag of it that I forgot to bring. I think I left it on the table. Um, but Damar resin is just um, a sap that comes from a tree in the East Indies. Um, I'm guessing some of you are oil painters here. So if you are an oil painter, you've probably heard of Damar varnish. Um, Damar varnish is made with Damar crystals. Basically, you just take Damar crystals and you soak them in uh, pure spirits of gum turpentine. Um, so what the Damar does in the mixture is it makes it um, a little bit more resilient to heat, um, so it hardens it. So when you paint with encaustic, and I'm using natural hair brushes, bristle hair brushes, usually hog hair because they're firmer, um, same ones you would use for something like acrylic or oil. Um, if you use synthetic brushes, they will probably melt. <laughs> and there's a lot of really great synthetic brushes out there now. I, in fact, when I do oil painting, I think half of my brushes are, are uh, synthetic these days, but not with encaustic. So um, you're applying it like you would, you know, your, from your palette to your board, um, like you would any other paint, okay? Um, and it cools very quickly. So, do, you have, do you have to pre-treat the board? Um, yeah, for the boards, um, you don't actually have to pre-treat them if you're working just on wood. Okay. The, the main thing that you want with a support for encaustic is you want something that's rigid. Yeah, so the medium is a combination of beeswax and Damar resin. So it's the same thing as the paint, only it doesn't have the color in it. I also have paraffin wax melting here. The paraffin wax is just used to um, clean the brushes. So when you get a brush dirty, or if you want to switch colors, you can just swish it around in the paraffin and wipe it with the paper towel, get out the excess color, the excess paraffin, and then you can move on. Now, you, I, in, in order to save time and save medium, or I'm sorry, a paraffin, because, you know, this eventually has to be disposed of and it goes into the environment or, you know, so I try to just keep um, a few brushes on here and then I try to coordinate them, like maybe I'll have a brush for like the warm colors, a brush for the cool colors, different brushes for black and white, so, I don't, so I'm not constantly cleaning them and then making dirty paraffin. So just in terms of the safety, that is the biggest safety concern, because a lot of people will say encaustic is very dangerous, that, you know, and it usually comes from people that know nothing about encaustic. If you actually take a workshop and you talk to somebody who's been working with encaustic for a while, you know, they'll, and they know about it, then they'll say, oh, you just have to be safe with it. Just like any other medium, you have to learn what is the safe practice of that medium. You know, I have a lot of these palettes when I do a workshop, I set them to the right temperature and then I just use the plug, I turn it on and off by unplugging it. That way I'm not 
constantly moving that dial and then I have to find the right temperature the next time I plug it in. I mean, I always check them just to make sure. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, that's an important thing. Obviously, not burning yourself, like Helen said, is really important. But I think it's more like cooking. It's one of those things where you learn very quickly, burn yourself a couple times, and, you know. Um, and then just, um, yeah, I mean, mostly it's just the, those types of things, um, not heating it high. Um, otherwise, it's safe. So. I'm going to keep painting here. So in terms of equipment, this will get at what you were asking. So what do you need? So you need a hot pellet that you can control the temperature of. Some people ask about warming trays. Warming trays usually don't get hot enough. Um, you can try them. Um, if you have something that only gets to about 180 degrees, it's going to be very frustrating to paint with it because it's not going to be hot enough to really get the paint fluid. What about an um, electric skillet? Electric skillet, the, the, the hot plates last me at least 15 years if I buy a good brand like a Toastmaster one. So once you buy it, you know, it's, you'll have it for life. Um, but they, the ones they sell now are a little bit more fancy, they're expensive. Some people who want to get into encaustic, they just don't know if they want to spend the money. So they uh, will start off with something like a pancake griddle, which you can buy for 20 bucks on sale, right? <coughs> Um, and that makes a great starter pellet. Those have a Teflon surface, which is fine. It's good for um, cleaning. They also have, actually, those pancake griddles heat better than some of the, the expensive pallets because they have a built-in coil underneath it. I mean, they're, you got to make good pancakes with them, so they have to have that <laughs> even heat. Whereas this one has much hotter... Um, temperature here than it does on the, the sides of it. Are, are those um, sets that they sell in the hot things like $500, is that worth buying? Um, you know, it depends. You can, the nice thing about everything being online is you can check the prices. Um, so usually they give you a little bit of a deal when you buy things in a kit like that. That's I think are usually a good way to start, but it's also good to just do the math and make sure that you are getting a deal. Um, and that you need everything that's in the set. So sometimes maybe they, you know, there's not everything, you don't need everything, so it's a waste. But I'd say, you, you know, you need the palette, you need some brushes, you're gonna need the heat gun, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, you need some paint, um, something like the iron, um, when I started, I was a graduate student, student, I didn't have any money, so when I started doing encaustic, I started really slow because I just didn't have the money to go out and buy the stuff. I was getting a lot of the paint for free, which was a big plus, but even the palette, I think my first palette was one that was damaged from r &F that I bought really cheap. Um, I bought a heat gun from them, but I didn't buy iron until probably like after I had been working with it for at least two or three years. Um, and then same thing with heated tools. And it really wasn't until I started teaching workshops that I started buying more equipment because then I needed it for my students. You know, for me, I was sort of satisfied just playing with it with, um, you know, a very minimal amount of stuff. Um, you can mix colors together on the palette. It's a little bit harder to do it on the painting. Is that glass that you're working on with your mixing of your colors? No, it's metal. It's um, it's um, aluminum. So we work on aluminum because it conducts the heat well. Copper would work too, but it's pretty expensive. And what's important about the, the metal that you're working on, um, in addition to it conducting the heat well, is you want it to be anodized if you're working on metal. Now, if you're working on a Teflon surface, you don't have to worry about that because it's already treated. And what, what it means to anodize something is you're treating the metal so that certain colors, like titanium white, has metal in it. So it reacts with the aluminum on the surface when it's heated. So it creates this kind of soot that you get. In fact, this, this palette, I believe, is not 
anodized. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can get detail. You can get detail with a small brush, which is challenging, but you can get detail other ways, which is easy. So I'll show you that too. Mm -hmm. But I notice people paint with dark caustic. It's kind of a modern style. So um, so you do find you have um, a majority of the people that work with encaustic mm -hmm. do more uh, mixed media collage, yeah, collage or things. abstract. Yeah. Um, but there are painters that work with it <coughs> in a very realistic way too. Yeah, I haven't seen any yet. Very, mm -hmm. not too many, right? Yeah. No. Um, so one of them that you might want to look up is, his name is easy to remember, his name is Kevin Frank. Um, and if you look at his encaustic paintings, you you probably wouldn't believe they're made with encaustic if you ever tried this medium out because he is a very, you know, technically amazing as a painter and the fact that he does it with encaustic is, you know, pretty incredible. But, you know, look at the Greeks. So the Greeks were making these paintings in the first and second centuries with encaustics that looked very realistic. Has anybody seen the Faya mummy portraits? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so look it up. The Faya mummy portraits, they actually have some at the MFA. They have some at the Sackler Museum <coughs> at, the Harvard, at Harvard University. And they have, I think, one or two at the Worcester Art Museum. So they're, they're around. Um, so the Faya mummy portraits are portraits that are made with encaustic. And they were made a long time ago before electricity. So if you see those paintings, you know, that's pretty amazing. You know, when we have all these tools that we can plug in and use to melt things, um, the fact that they did those paintings with probably just heating tools on a cold brazier or putting them in the sun, I'm sure that's how they did it. Um, all right, almost done. Once you put it on the board, how soon does it cool that it doesn't burn your finger when you cut Oh, it's pretty quickly. You know, it, it cools pretty immediately. Yeah, I mean, I, I am in the bad habit of saying dry, but it really doesn't dry. Um, encaustic paint cools, and it, it doesn't change from its liquid state to its solid state chemically, so that's why it's better to say cool. Okay, so now we have this beautiful painting. Um, and then the next step would be, um, I'm going to fuse it. So fusing is an encaustic term. And fusing just means that I'm going to melt the wax. Okay? So there's a couple reasons why you would melt the wax after you put a layer on it. So I'm not saying this is done. I'm going to continue to work on it. Um, so the reason we want to melt the wax is on the first layer, you want to make sure that the oils from the wax are really soaking into the panel underneath. So the way you do that is you melt the wax and those oils really penetrate through the support that you're working on. Um, so that's one thing. So that's an archival thing. That is for the longevity of the painting. So that way, uh, if it's fused well to the board, if um, UPS, if you're shipping it to, um, mm -hmm. you know, your friend in Alaska, and it's cold, and you're, the UPS guy throws the box that your painting's in, um, <laughs> and it, you know, hit, then hopefully you've packed it well, um, but hopefully because you fuse that painting well, the the wax doesn't crack off the surface because wax does get more brittle when it gets on. <laughs> or don't leave it in the back seat of the car. I've done that. Yeah. Yep, learned that lesson pretty quickly. Um, above a fireplace. Um, <laughs> you know, you get, you, you learn. Um, but the cold is one of those things that people don't think about, but it is, uh, can be a problem too. Um, so I'm going to fuse it. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to try to keep, the first thing I'm going to do is try to keep the brush strokes where they are. Because when you melt it, things can start to move pretty quickly. So I'm just going to do a really light fusing on it. Approximately um, what temperature is the heat gun? So the, the heat gun, 
This is a heat gun in case you haven't seen one before. Um, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are industrial that you find at like Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever. Um, this is sort of like a medium one. It's not really a really small one and it's not a really large one. It's not super expensive. It's not super loud. It's kind of a really good one for encaustic. It has a temperature control here. And this one goes from 120 to 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, good Lord. Wow. So much hotter than your hair dryer. Somebody asked me about a hair dryer. I was going to ask you about Yeah. No. You, you can try a hair dryer. Um, it's very gentle. If you get any, any melting to happen, it's probably very minimal. OK, so it's not ideal. Um, this obviously gets much hotter. Um, so you have to be careful with it. It's, it can be dangerous. Um, usually you work flat. That's the problem with encaustic when you're demoing is um, because you can get drips really easily. It's called gravity, you know. <laughs> so you're just looking for the wax to just melt? Yeah, so Soften if you, if you yeah. I know the light's not great. So just a little shiny? A little shiny says it's melting. So. If you get it a little shiny, then what you're doing is you're just making sure you're adhering that wax a little bit better to that board so you don't have any problems with it coming off. Now, it's not really thick. I only have one layer on here, so I probably would never have a problem with it, but, you know, it's good practice. I'm going to get a nice straight edge with that. So this one, I think it's ready to scrape. And remember, this part, I scribed in some lines with this tool, and I also used um, the pattern wheel to make some lines. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna take my um, razor blade, I'm gonna clean it off because it has a little bit of wax on it. Everything that's metal, you can just clean right on the palette there. And then I'm gonna, I have to keep it flat when I do this because otherwise it, I can't get an even scrape. So I'm just going to show you as I go. So I'm basically scraping off the red. And I'm trying to scrape it in a level way so that it doesn't dig into the, uh, the panel and it just leaves my, my lines. So see what's happening there? Mm -hmm. So they call that encaustic in Okay, so the iron, you guys have been wanting to see this iron forever. Um, so the iron, it's, it's not used as much as the heat gun. Mostly, I just use it for smoothing surfaces. I'll show you what happens when you use the iron on a surface where you have, um, yeah, this is a photography tacking iron. That's what it is. Um, you could use like a um, travel iron. So what do you think it's used for? It's used to smooth surfaces. Thank you so much, Tracy Spudafora, for demonstrating such an interesting subject. Many in your audience have never seen a demonstration on encaustic before and are now interested in this fascinating type of art. <laughs>